Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, English Language Learner Literacy under the Every Student Succeeds Act. My name is Corey Mitchell, and I'm a staff writer for Education Week. Uh, today's webinar has been sponsored by Middlebury Interactive Languages. And uh, today we're just going to look at um, English language learners under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, as many states experience growth in their English language learner populations, changes required by the new federal law give this group of students a higher profile and reflect their growing importance in measuring overall student achievement. But the change doesn't come without complications. Some state education agencies are still unsure how they will interpret and implement the law's mandates. Thanks for joining us for this for this conversation with administrators from the Charlotte Mecklenburg, North Carolina, and Roseville, Minnesota school districts to, to examine their plans for adjusting to the new federal law. And I want to introduce those guests uh, from Roseville, Minnesota is the English Learners Program Administrator, Christina Robertson. And from Charlotte is Charlotte Naja Trez, the Executive Director of English Learner Services. Before we begin, now's a good time to review some of the technical aspects of today's presentation. Please check the audio setting on your computer as well as your speaker volume settings if you are having any audio trouble. If you are still having issues, please see our detailed audio troubleshooting file available in the resources list under the Q&A window. There are also some other icons that open some additional features, feature panels in our webinar console. You can read about today's speakers in this bio panel, access the resource list to download a copy of today's slides, and follow the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter using the hashtag EWWebinar. To submit a question for our speakers, type them in the Q&A box located above the resource list window. Finally, an on-demand archive of today's presentation will be available online in the next 24 hours. Both the archive and a free-to-download version of the PowerPoint slides will be accessible through edweek.org. And that's E-D-W-E-E-K dot O-R-G. Now I'd like to hand over the presentation to Christina. Thank you, Corey. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm giving a sort of a general overview of what I've experienced in Minnesota regarding the new Every Child Succeeds Act and ELs. And um, basically, we're kind of just getting things off the ground. So this is really a lot about my hopes and dreams for what it will mean for us. So, um, so just a little bit about Minnesota to give you some context, uh, some fast facts about us. Our EL population here has increased by over 300% over the last 20 years. So we currently have about 72,000 English learners, and we're a primary relocation site for many of refugee populations. Uh, some of our largest communities are Hmong, Somali, and Karen. The Karen people come from Burma. Um, and so we, we, we have a lot of variety in our programming and the services and needs with our populations. We also have a lot of immersion programs. Uh, Spanish and dual immersion, um, as well as other languages such as Chinese, German, and French in our in our state. And um, one of the things we're most excited about recently is that our legislature passed the LEAPS Act in 2015, which requires professional development on EL instructional strategies for all educators, including administrators, um, as well as tracking our SLIFE student population. And here, SLIFE stands for Students with Limited or Interrupted Formal Education. Um, they're called different things maybe in different um, states, but that's, that's what we call them here. So, so there's some exciting things going on as far as increasing our focus on ELs at a local level, um, and I think it hopefully will dovetail nicely with what is happening at the federal level with ESSA. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. 
Uh, so a little bit about our real local context in Roseville Public Schools. We're a suburb of St. Paul, Minnesota, so um, many people may recognize St. Paul as a very large uh, school district with, uh, I think, 30,000 ELs in it or something. We have 7,616 students with about 17% EL, so about uh, 1,200 students. And our top languages are Spanish, Hmong, Karen, Somali, and Nepali. So we're kind of like a little microcosm of of the state, really, for the different cultures that we serve. We're very blessed to have 14 cultural liaisons who speak those languages um, and also work with uh, American Indian and African American student, students. Um, and then we have many models for our, our, our language development. Collaborative model, co-taught, targeted language instruction, which would be sort of a pull-out or a standalone uh, class, dual language immersion, and SLICE newcomer at our high school level. Uh, we also have about 30 ESL licensed teachers in the districts, and there are teachers at each site. Um, so when I was asked to come forward and, and do this webinar with you, I was sort of um, asked, well, how do I think ESSA would affect our EL programming and what changes do I think I'll see? And right now, there aren't a lot of changes happening. We're still in some development phases with our state, but the most obvious change, which is good and maybe challenging is that there's no Title III AMAO notification letters or a plan required. So we used to have to send out letters through Title III to say that we were not meeting academic goals and that sort of thing. We didn't have to send out all those letters, which was kind of a relief because we still have to send out notification letters to let everybody know that EL students are still in um, you know, EL services and, and what kind of programming they get. Uh, right now our state is holding stakeholder meetings. They've been working on it over the last few months and they'll be going forward to get gather feedback from all kinds of stakeholders about what they need to do with ESSA um, and EL is one of those components and they will be making some recommendations with that. Um, so this is just, this is from our state website, but it kind of gives you an idea of their timeline of how they're doing things. So. Um, Every Student Succeeds Act was signed into law in December, and you can see January through November of this year, they've been doing a lot of stakeholder meetings, gathering a lot of information, and then they're going to be making some recommendations and guidelines by March of 2017. So in a lot of ways, we're still in a holding pattern and a waiting game to find out what exactly it will look like when the state um, processes that information. Um, so that said, here's some of the things I hope uh, we'll, we will see after this um, stakeholder information is gathered. So um, my hope is that EL student achievement will become integrated into mainstream concerns among leaders and teachers. I mean, one of the benefits of having Title III as a separate um, entity within the system was that we had some money and things set aside. We had some guidelines that were established just for English learners, but it also set us up as a silo and not as something that was on the mainstream accountability. Um, most of the um, uh, you know, principals or teacher leaders I talked to um, outside of language teachers um, don't really know a lot about what language learners need and what their um, like proficiency uh, scores mean and that sort of thing. So, so bringing them more into the mainstream would be really helpful. So under that, I'm hoping that maybe there'd be some new data formulas that would be more robust so they would account for things like um, EL language development by proficiency level. So we're part of the WIDA consortium and um, Gary Cook has done some analysis of national WIDA access scores and, and basically says lower is faster, higher is slower. So at the beginning levels, usually we see more rapid growth and that at the higher proficiency levels, we would see some slower growth. And so right now, the way that the accountability had been set up, it was a 0.5 proficiency level growth overall. Um, so maybe we can have some more um, specifics regarding by the actual English language proficiency level of a student. Also, measuring growth using scale scores rather than the proficiency levels would be more accurate. Um, and then also taking into account type and quality of language instruction program, that would be very huge because um, it's one thing to just measure how fast a student is growing in their language skills, but if we don't also account for the kind of input and support they're getting for language, it's really not going to get us where we need to be. Um, and then also length, length of time in the program. So if we're looking at long-term ELs and what, what's brought them to that place or what kind of supports they need. Um, 
Of course, I would love to see funding allocated for native language assessments because my understanding is that ESSA will provide for native language assessments, but um, we need more funding if that's going to happen. Increased accountability for EL's language development, um, I hope, will lead to more professional development and the idea that all teachers are language teachers. We know that the students need more than 30 minutes a day of language instruction or, you know, some kind of an intervention for language. They need, they need all teachers to understand how language works. So if we can through the new ESSA requirements, start to have more focus on that and professional development for all teachers, that would be terrific. Um, and then just really hoping for increased collaboration um, for between mainstream teachers and administrators and those who are um, ELL teachers or bilingual teachers because um, my experience has been that a lot of times the ELs, because they're in a separate category, kind of seen as a silo, they can be seen as um, the EL teacher's responsibility uh, or that, that language would be taken care of by a certain teacher versus all teachers. And so I'm hoping that, that moving their uh, um, language proficiency scores and their performance and attention to them into a more mainstream funding source would bring them um, into a more collaborative environment to work towards meeting their language development needs. Um, so some of my fears. Um, you'll notice that my first bullet is the same as one of my hopes, which was that um, EL student achievement will become integrated into mainstream concerns among leaders and teachers. Um, once there is perhaps more attention on accountability for EL students and their achievement and language growth um, among people who don't really understand language development and what is required to grow language, that there could be a over-reliance on strategies that um, are heavily emphasized um, maybe some literacy interventions, uh, more interventions that could get, lead more towards a special education route or something versus actual quality language instruction throughout the whole day that's explicitly tied to content. Um, so there, there is a bit of a fear there um, that EL students will be increasingly channeled into remedial options in, to, in order to eliminate the achievement gap. Uh, that funding would be reduced for Title III and less direct EL funding will be available through Title I. So if Title III funding, while it's small in comparison to Title III, is reduced further in order to um, enhance Title I funding or if they are combined eventually, that the, the possibility would be that um, anything for ELs would have to be sort of carved out of that funding and it could be more indirect things like more family engagement or um, bilingual resources but not necessarily the quality instruction and professional development. Um, and then a, a fear that an emphasis would be placed on trying to speed the exiting of EL students um, out of the program, you know, because there there is a reality that if a student is at a proficiency level of say five on the access, they are more likely to understand content and be successful. Um, so yes, we always want to try to accelerate their language development, but they need time. You can't just, you can't rush through it um, and, and they need to be able to um, get the support they need along the way. So I, I would be fearful that we might have an overemphasis on exiting students out of program. Um, so just a quick overview again of the Minnesota ESSA uh, requirements that I'm I've heard about so far. The accountability will be moved from Title III, the AMAO, into Title I. Former ELs can be included in accountability reporting for up to four years. Standardized EL program entry and exit procedures, which I think is something that they're looking across the nation, which would be fabulous. Um, limited English proficient is now English learners. They're looking at adding student groups to the accountability formula, so ELs with disabilities and long-term Ls and then possible to assess in students' native language so they can make that more prominent, and then promoting parental involvement. So those are some of the things that are going on in Minnesota, what they're reviewing. One thing, again, we're very excited about in Minnesota is our LEAPS Act, and this was a law that was passed here in Minnesota, and it's, it states that uh, language is an asset to be built upon. We really want all educators to um, understand the strengths that our students come with, that their native language is really a way to inform what they can do in English and other languages, and that all teachers need to understand how that works. Um, so really an emphasis on professional development and also providing opportunities for students to use their bilingual and multilingual skills to receive credit for college or even um, credit at a high school level. 
so there's there's a lot of really exciting things going on with that. Um, so we're really proud of that here in Minnesota. Um, uh, finally, some implications. So what they're looking at for the ESTA with our ELs is that we have a world's best workforce plan here with five areas of focus. All children are ready for school. All third graders can read at grade level. All racial and economic achievement gaps between students are closed. All students are ready for career and college, and all students graduate from high school. So, you know, a lot of these are kind of similar to the No Child Left Behind uh, uh, law that has been in place, but uh, all of our school improvement or district improvement plans are aligned with this world best workforce. So they're looking at um, taking the ESSA law and aligning it with this. And then we have a, a school improvement rating system called Multiple Measures, and it's, it's a growth-based rating system. So it'll be interesting to see how they take that and, and um, integrate that into ESSA and the requirements for accountability. So some questions that I have thinking of all of this coming forward is, will moving accountability out of Title III strengthen or weaken the professional development and quality instruction ELs deserve? Right now I have a little pot of money that I can use towards professional development directly to meet the needs of English learners. Um, if that money gets shifted in the future or if um, it's seen as more of Title I and, and someone else has, say, control of that fund, um, how will EL professional development be funded? Um, and then how can district EL leaders best advocate for an asset-based mindset for language development? I mean, this is just an ongoing concern <laughs> at any time, which is helping others who don't necessarily understand how language develops understand that our students come with strengths, linguistic and cultural and experiential, things that we just don't have the ability to see and measure sometimes at this time. So, but that, but that we definitely want to know who our students are and build on those strengths. So how do we continue to have those um, equity conversations and operate at a higher level to meet the needs of students? And then finally, how can EL district leaders gain control of additional Title I funds to, rec to directly meet the needs of ELs? And I guess that's sort of a repeat from my first one. You can see um, the control of some funds to directly meet the needs of ELs is a concern going forward with, with ESSA. So that's my overview from uh, the Midwest here in Minnesota. If you have questions or want to follow up on any of the things I've shared with you, feel free to contact me. We do have a very um, aggressive spam filter, so you do have to, if you email me, uh, you'll get a bounce back that makes you say that you're not a bot, and you will say that you are not a bot, and then you'll be able to email me. <laughs> so, But that's it. Back to you, Corey. Thanks for this opportunity to share. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, before we move on to Charlotte, uh, we've got a quick message from our sponsors, Middlebury Interactive Languages. Yeah, thanks, Corey. This is Chad Shader. I'm Senior Vice President with Middlebury. And I uh, really want to thank Ed Week for having us and, and for Christina and Nadja for participating in this great webinar. Um, just very quickly, Middlebury Interactive Languages is a joint venture with Middlebury College uh, based in Middlebury, Vermont. And we're really focused on second language acquisition for both uh, ELL as well as world languages. And with our ELL programs, we're focused on, um, well, we've created a, a blended supplemental program that's designed uh, for use in a number of, of uh, different models, uh, as Christina was referring to, um, and across three different grade bands, um, starting with a level entering uh, in, our, in our high school programs, uh, we will have a level entering very shortly in our middle school and moving on so that students are able to, 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 uh, to become uh, no longer classified as an L. So, um, and focusing in on academic vocabulary as we do. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more later uh, in the uh, webinar today. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to move you on to a quick poll question to see if you'd like to get a little more information on how our company supports uh, ELS. Corey, okay. I hand it back uh, okay, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our second presenter, uh, Naja, uh, the Executive Director of English Learner Service Services in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg North Carolina School District. Uh, before 
Naj joined the Charlotte uh, Schools as the Executive Director of English Learner Services. Uh, she worked as a Title III Director and ESL Consultant at the state level with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Uh, during that time, she served as a President for the National Council of State Three Title Directors, providing leadership to state and local Title III Directors, and collaborated with the National Association of State Title I Directors and the U.S. Depart Education Department Office of State Support Team. Um, she's been an ELL educator, linguist, and language practitioner at the district, state, and international level for 20 years. So um, I'd like to hand it over to Naja. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Naja Tres, Executive Director. I have been in this role about 10 months, and I'm delighted to share our department's strategic plan, including the vision and mission statement and overarching goal that are um, closely aligned with the new uh, ESSA requirement, as well as the January 2015 Joint English L Learner Guidance Document by USCD OCR Office, as well as the DOJ OCR Division. I just wanted to start with this quote from, the doc doc from Dr. Kenji Hakura at Stanford. The college and career-ready standards have put a spotlight on how students must use language to communicate, learn, and demonstrate their learning. This paradigm shift focuses on language demand of a content area instead of separating language from content. This shift emphasizes how L students can benefit greatly from this standard, and it also stresses that teachers must collaborate to make this learning happening. So I'm very excited about this um, a new kind of a direction, and this is the direction I'm taking moving forward as a department head. So our vision is to meet the individual needs of linguistically and culturally diverse students by providing equitable opportunities and advocating for every English learner in every school. Our mission is to empower all English learners to be globally engaged by meeting their linguistic and academic needs within their sociocultural context. We provide high quality, rigorous and engaging instructional support through research, which is old um, NCLB language, and evidence-based practice, which is a new ESSA language. We collaborate with all stakeholders to ensure equitable access to that impacts achievement and opportunity gaps so our English learners graduate college and career ready. So I'm going to share our five overarching goals that will be serving as a roadmap uh, as we drive to support our L's and their teachers and parents. Uh, goal number one is to develop and implement a multi-tiered L's professional plan around the WIDA standard. Uh, North Carolina is one of the WIDA standards as well for all teachers working with L's. This plan is customizable within its school and learning community context and culture. So I'm going to share a simple comprehensive PD plan that can be seen as an umbrella with an overarching goal rather than silos of a vendor-driven PD program. So we are customizing all the PD program that are available for L and make it our own. The importance, uh, importance of this approach is to keep the context of a school in mind so we can give flexibility to given any PD framework framework of a fidelity. So one component is this plan. The most important plan is to collect and analyze school, teacher, and student level data. So whatever we are providing in terms of a PD can be uh, directly related to student achievement data. Goal number two is the most exciting goal that we have is to develop, share, and support the implementation of a curriculum resources corresponding to ELD and content standards for all teachers as well. I'm particularly excited about this goal since, um, in my mind, they will provide means of leveling the playing field for L so they can have access to authentic text while they are supported by differentiated scaffolding uh, strategies. 
Uh, so uh, what we kind of have done in the past is we talked about scaffolding strategy, differentiation, um, differentiation, but I don't think we have necessarily provided some exemplar lessons or unit or tasks that are embedded uh, for our teachers, especially our content teachers. So over the uh, course of last year, our department developed a series of uh, curriculum resources in English language art, grade uh, 9 through 12, mathematics, grade 4 or 6 through 8, uh, eight and math 1, which is for grade 9, as well as uh, English as a Second Language Resource Lab at high school level. Also, we also uh, developed curricula resources for students with interrupted formal education, five students corresponding to college and career ready standards. So we are, well, we are trying to um, uh, move away from dumbing down curriculum resources. So we want to uh, set high expectation for our L students, even though they are newcomers. We also develop uh, the talent development in North Carolina uh, that's a gifted student, a gifted and ESL collaboration to write portfolio project for students that need L support. So we have invited ESL teachers and content teachers to this project over the summer to ensure that we are integrating language and content in a meaningful way. So in order to help support the acquisition of academic language in content courses, we had our content teachers have created this uh, academic content module for newcomers. So yes, our content teachers create uh, these modules for newcomers. These modules are embedded with the differentiated scaffolds for the unit in core classes, and each module consists of a two-part, a digital learning pathway and a differentiated handbook. By the way, all the resources we developed over the summer, we are sharing with everybody who are participating in this webinar, and you will get the link uh, later on at, uh, at the end of the presentation. The Digital Learning Pathway our website was created by curating and organizing learning activities that students access to learn essential questions, academic vocabularies, and concept of the content class. So students can work on this independently or with the partners. And this module offers sort of a kind of a flipped learning experience for our newcomer students. Here are six differentiated handbooks for American History One, which are correlated to digital learning pathway found uh, in the previous um, slide. These differentiated handbook pictures here are digital magazine created um, using a, a flip HTML5.com. There's another uh, digital resource, and they are uh, easily accessible online, or they can be downloaded or printed for students to use either in or outside of a class for blended uh, opportunity. So each handbook has two levels of differentiation for beginning and more advanced levels. So academic content is presented, and the student make connection between visuals and written text. They are also able to refer to the digital learning pathways, videos, and text, and vocabulary for added support. Another example shown here, the incorporating learning activities for varied learning style is evidence in the beginning in this beginning handbook about um, about the early English colony American history. I'm just showing another example, and tactile learners will appreciate this kind of a matching activity. A more advanced handbook may have a fewer scaffolds, of course, but there are uh, still supports uh, if they need it, such as um, video guides or reading or writing activities, um, things like that. And the most uh, exciting part is the ELA lessons. So our curriculum development team has also been creating lessons for high school English language art classes in grades 9 through 12. Each lesson is differentiated for three different uh, English proficiency levels for each instructional segment of each lesson. The lessons are displayed in digital magazine again, 
uh, lesson centers on a specific main literature selection, such as a short story, poet, poetry, play uh, for each grade level, and they also include nonfiction text selection or current event article related to the theme or topics of a main literature selection they are studying in their ELA classes. This gives the student opportunity for citing multiple texts and close reading and analysis and comparison. I am super excited and so proud of our teachers and staff members because in my mind these are coding as resources developed for our English language art content teachers. So this is a sample template of what components are found in each lesson. The lessons include a comprehensive lesson plan with the detailed instructional procedures and three differentiated student paths with visual prompt to indicate which handout or activity will be used in each lesson segment. So this is not um, the series of a lesson created is just an exemplar lesson that we create so in hope that teachers will follow this kind of a format so they should be able to create their own or modify these exemplar lessons for them to create their own. So all of the lessons created by um, Curriculum Resources de Development Team follow the three moment lesson design from West at QTEL, the scaffolded instruction and learning tasks in each lesson are based on the tri focus of first, preparing learners, second, interacting with concept and text, and third, extending understanding with both content and language learning. So this is kind of our framework in terms of a curriculum model. Okay. As a student enter school or throughout the year, they will be exposed to the vi uh, vital anchor standard, anticipatory set, and learning task and assessment. They are introduced and spiraled. Uh, students are given multiple opportunity for personalization for their learning through personal choice, and they will have a multiple opportunity to revisit anchor standard or move forward and create personal project related to lesson theme or content. This slide is a handout of a link to ESL iPad trade project we, be, we begun 2014 and it also has other curriculum resources that I just went over. So that was our goal number two. Our goal number three is to implement an innovative technology integrated learn language learning environment via, via various technology integration projects such as the iPad cohort and a Skype iPad project. And we are also planning to collect data to measure the effective, effectiveness of uh, this initiative. And this is a kind of a screenshot of uh, our annual iPad pro uh, project showcase where our 90 ESL teachers get together and then uh, showcase their uh, project with the students using iPad. And this year we are piloting a new pilot called SIP iPad project with a small group of uh, students. This, uh, this project is particularly exciting in that students in this cohort will be able to take their iPad home with preloaded instructional resources, apps that do not require internet connection, and our own uh, resources. So I have included our process for this project for your information, just in case you, you would like to replicate. One thing I would like to highlight is that we'll have that uh, have the pre-iPad implementation interview in the beginning of a school year soon and post-iPad implementation interview recorded at the end of the school year to measure success of this initiative. Our next goal in terms of our strategic plan, we are partnering with the WIDA resource team for a longitudinal data analysis, so-called high-flying and low-cruising district project. Uh, CMS will determine where each school lies on a 
performance continuum according to the data analysis, which have English language proficiency data and school level demographic factors and other measures of academic performance. We are hoping that we will identify exemplar schools in assisting L students and we can uh, use them as a model to provide any technical assistance or support in other schools in our district. So our last goal um, was formed uh, mainly based on our DOJ or CR EL guidance document to provide English learner students equal opportunity to participate in rigorous instructional programs to address not only the achievement gaps, but also the opportunity gaps. Here are some examples of our focus area, such as meeting the promotion and graduation requirement, equitable uh, opportunity to participate in curricular, co-curricular, or extracurricular activities. So we are collaborating with other departments, such as talent, um, the gifted department, students with a disability, athletics, and CTE, APIBs, to make sure that our L students has um, equitable opportunity to those programs. One thing I would like to highlight uh, that uh, collaboration and the being heavily involved with the district-wide literacy initiative is very crucial. Um, our district, CMS, is a thriving and reading district when it comes to the instructional leadership team approach, where stakeholders are serving as a collaborative partners in ongoing conversation about teaching and learning for all students. So our department um, always makes sure that we are part of the uh, uh, district level planning and implementation, and we also provide any additional support needed for our ESL teachers so they can be part of the IALT team at their respective school. Um, and North Star Reading Partner Initiative is our district-wide commitment to supporting literacy. As part of that commitment, last year our L uh, Services Department staff became mentors and reading buddies to make a commitment to one child for one hour once a week. So uh, we kind of extended our, our North Star um, initiative. So in order to better serve our L's, we extended our effort and implemented North Star 2.0 to support our site student particularly. So we served, uh, we um, had a logo of uh, two children, two hours, twice a week, that our whole department staff, about 38 uh, of them, becoming uh, literacy mentors or leading, reading partners with our L students. And this year we are focusing more on supporting our SIPE students. So I went through a lot of slides because I wanted to uh, share all the great work we are doing. Thank you so much for participating and learning about our, how CMS is supporting English learners. And here is my contact information in case you have any questions or comments. Uh, if you go through this uh, PowerPoint slide, there are a lot of um, Google links that you can have access to all the curriculum development. Uh, resources development, development uh, and also um, the most important thing is a district level support. So I have to thank our uh, chief academic officer for his continuous support and make this wonderful work possible. And I'm going to hand it over to Corey. Uh, thank you, Anaja, for that uh, presentation. But don't go away just yet because we're about to start the Q&A. And uh, the first question I have is for you. Uh, okay. comes from a uh, comes from a uh, a participant um who wants to know about districts ignoring the needs of english learners uh she wants to know if you have any ideas or go to resources to let administrators and teachers know that they can't just treat um these english learner students like everybody else well, actually, there are several, like a federal document. For example, uh, the 2015 January, there was a L English Learner Guidance document that was issued by the OCR office and DOJ office, and it kind of a uh, um, uh, kind of a spell out all the requirements. And I know when I was working at the state level, a lot of LEAs. 
uh, when they kind of a middle roadblock like that, they use those documents a lot. And because it was just kind of written there and then having crucial conversation and I think providing data and especially on the new ESSA, as um, Christina mentioned, that title, there is no more Title III accountability in terms of AMAO. Everything is going to be under Title I, so each school will be held accountable for their English language proficiency progress and proficiency. So I think those federal gov um, government document and Title III document and then data point and then new ESSA requirement probably will be very helpful to have a crucial conversation with the administrators. I hope I answered the question. Oh, definitely. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question that we have is for Christina. Uh, the participant would like to know um, how a, a, a district or school uh, can best address the large increase of languages represented by refugee families in, our, in schools. Uh, with, with dual language or, or bilingual programs that are traditionally only Spanish and English? Um, yeah, this is challenging. I, I would need some more information to be able to answer it really completely, but uh, I, I can give you some of my thoughts of what I would look at. So first of all, the question would be, are your, are your teachers content area teachers who are bilingual? Or are they teachers who have also um, had language development training and um, could be like more like an English language learner teacher or have some specific um, uh, EL focused instruction? Basically what needs to happen is you need to have targeted English instruction for those students who are not Spanish bilingual. So we have in our dual language immersion program in our district, um, basically kind of the building is, is separated by kind of language programming. So we have our dual language classrooms, um, two classrooms for each grade level, um, and then uh, for our EL students, so there are many different language groups, Hmong, Karen, um, you know, just, just a variety of languages. We have just, they're only EL teachers, they're not bilingual. And so those students are placed in classrooms and they have a specific targeted instructional time to meet with the EL teacher. If you are in a system where all of your teachers are bilingual, um, and if it's a dual language model, there has to be some time during the day where students are getting English exposure. The trick would be to take that time and rather having it being just maybe content English exposure, actually creating English explicit instructional times. So you would have to somehow have your teachers work more like almost in a guided reading kind of group format where you have some flexible grouping and you would bring the students into a small group to have some explicit language instruction to develop their English language skills at that level. Um, I think you'd, you'd have to look at your population and see how many students you have because obviously they can't be in the Spanish bilingual content environment for most of their day so you might have to look at creating a classroom that is for um, students who are not going to be in Spanish bilingual. It's, it's very tricky if that is what your main main program has been. Um, but you have to look at the numbers and your staffing and the time and carve it out. Okay, thank you, uh, Christina. Our mm -hmm. next uh, question I will toss to uh, Anaja. It's, it's about new ELL um, English learner students moving into a district. Um, in this particular case, the students are identified as, as limited English proficient. Um, but uh, the participant wants to know about creating a, a plan um, to help these students out and is, is unsure of the requirements. Um, how would you suggest they proceed? Okay, so I'm going to go over the requirement first and, and I'm going to share what kind of a data sources we are using in our district. So again, I'm going back to um, DOJ or CRL guidance document. It is spelled out that according to Title III on the ESEA, the school district must use Title III funds for effective approaches and methodologies for teaching ELF and increase the English proficiency of ELF by providing effective language instruction education program. That's the FED uh, uh, lingo, which is LIP, another word, ESL program or services we are providing that meet the needs of ELF and demonstrate success 
uh, in the content area. And also there's another federal legislation piece on the Title VI and EEOA, which is Equal Education Opportunity Act. The school district must provide a language assistance program, which is similar to LIP, that is effective and educationally sound and proven successful. So that's kind of a, your kind of a guiding kind of principle when you have a conversation and when you create your own um, the plan. So in our district, so we have our own district-wide LIP plan, and each school is expected to have their own LIPs and submit to our office. So I'm going to share some multiple data source or data reflective practices we use. So we use, of, English, of course, English language proficiency level. It can be domain specific and or it can be overall composite proficiency level. We also look at years in uh, U.S. school, but in this case, a newcomer. So newcomers, a lower proficiency level and the newcomers get the priority and they have to get maximum uh, more uh, ELD time. We also look at their first language literacy, and we also look at their previous schooling, whether it is interrupted or continuous, and we also look at their grade level expectation, if they are struggling or they are meeting or they are exceeding grade level expectation. And also, at the end of the day, our goal would be our L to be successful in their classroom and eventually uh, graduate college and career ready. So especially for high school, we are trying to focusing on their graduation requirement to make sure they are on, on track to graduate. And we also uh, look at the data, the rec such as recommendation from former teachers, but in in your case, in her case, the newcomers, so um, you have to look at their transcript. So we have uh, two bilingual counselors who are in charge of uh, doing the international transcript um, evaluation, so they are in communication with um, high school counselors at high school. And any other data they are available, uh, available uh, we kind of use that to kind of create district-wide and school-wide LIEP plan. Okay, thank you, Anaja. Uh, the next question I have is for Christina. Um, a participant wants to know about uh, training, uh, specifically how uh, training for the every, uh, how will training for the Every Student Succeed Act affect the professional development needs of school system, uh, especially as it relates to um, what topics they have to tackle? Um, that's a good question. Can I phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have a magic uh, uh, crystal ball. I do have a magic eight ball here, and I could ask it. But, uh, you know, I, I again go back to my hope. I really hope, because Title I, if you look at the amount of funding available through Title I versus Title III, it could be an amazing resource for us. And if, if there is more attention to the accountability for language learners within Title I that is appropriately placed on language development in addition to literacy and math skills, it could be a, 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 a tremendous um, opportunity for collaboration and for quality professional development that's truly well-rounded to meet the needs of English learners. So, so the hopeful side of me says, it's going to be great. We're going to work with Title I directors and there's going to be funding and we're going to have more um, truly balanced, integrated, content-based language professional development. Uh, districts will uh, fund EL experts and specialists to provide professional development and work with networks of teachers so that everyone can become well-versed in language and um, some of the WIDA tools that can help teachers become stronger, um, you know, teachers of language. Because basically, you know, it doesn't matter if I can walk on water as a language teacher working with ELs 30 minutes a day, I will not be able to accelerate their language to the level for them to be successful. The only way we can do it is for all teachers to understand how language works and to instruct through content throughout the whole day. So when I think about the efforts that have gone into literacy development, for example, what we have been able to do through Title III for language development and professional development has been just minuscule compared to what can happen through Title I. So 
I look at this as a great opportunity to start those conversations and say, look, we've been working on literacy for a long, long time. We have more ELs than ever, more languages than ever. We know more than ever about what needs to be happening for language development in content. So let's let's put some of these funds towards quality professional development and um, support systems for teachers. So that's that's my hopeful answer. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Christina. Uh, the next question that we have is for Naja. Um, the participant wants to know what should uh, ESL teachers use um, when it comes to ELA standards, and how should they adapt them to, to the needs of the English learners, uh, if at all? Or perhaps should these folks just use WIDA standards, which um, they think may not be as broad and as rigorous? Um, um, yeah, and North Carolina is a WIDA standard. We joined WIDA consortium in 2008, so we are one of the first kind of a pioneer uh, states who used the WIDA. So yes, uh, she is right. WIDA is a framework. It's not the objective-driven standard. So that is the beauty of a WIDA standard. There is a flexibility. So key is um, you cannot just take a WIDA standard and then teach to the standard. You have to create and you have to integrate with the content because WIDA standard is all about language of content, language of ELA, language of math, social study. So you probably, uh, my recommendation would be working with the content teachers, so what kind of a language they need for them, for students to be successful in the, social, uh, in the content area. So uh, they can be hand in hand in terms of planning and lesson delivery. And there are a lot of tools uh, when you look at the WIDA, the MPI, Model Performance in Indicator, you probably wanted to be familiar with how to transform Model Performance Indicator to create language target, not objective. Again, broad, so um, students have more rooms to grow and show what they are learning and their performance. Uh, Definition is definitely something to look for when you're looking at the formative assessment for L using the WIDA. And again, with the content um, standard kind of uh, correspond to each other as well as a can-do descriptor. So, so WIDA standards are not like objective driven. Again, it's a framework, so there are a lot of room for you to create, it, create awesome lesson working with the content teachers. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Naja. Uh, the next question I have is for Christina. Uh, the participant would like to know in what ways parents um, have been a part of the, the strategic plan when it comes to English learners, especially as stakeholders. Um, I'm sure that many of these educators want parents to, to play a role with their children, but um, they want to know how um, your interaction or, you know, staff interaction goes with parents on the front end and actually developing um, what these, these students are taught and what is expected of them. Um, so I, I'll give a couple of examples to answer, to, to answer that question. Uh, I've been in this district for a little over a year and just started getting to know the cultural liaisons and working with them more closely. And what we're focusing on this year is developing networks of, of parents because they, they've been on a pretty much needs to know basis and just interacting um, regarding forms that come home and things that are happening, um, you know, and, and little scheduled events and things at our schools. So now this year we're, we're focusing on bringing the parents together more in their cultural networks. So, for example, having um, Karen community nights or having, uh, you know, Nepali community nights or Spanish language community nights so that the, the parents are beginning to develop their own network and start to um, you know, kind of develop their own leadership within their communities with the goal that they become more informed of what is what we even are talking about with our educational agendas and, and what's coming up, and then they can be more informed and, and at the table to give some feedback on these things. At this point, we have included them through, you know, um, 
family focus groups. We just recently did a strategic plan in our district and we had these bilingual cultural nights where we asked parents for feedback about what's working well for you, what, what's challenging for you, what do you want us to keep in mind when we make the strategic plan. And, and it really did inform our strategic plan. We put things in place that um, really focused on improving it at, you know, at the district level our instruction for language learners, our um, out, outreach to families and communities in a variety of ways and with uh, different languages. So, that, so there were some real good outcomes from that. I would also say that in a previous district I was in, we had been doing this for longer and we had those groups already established kind of. So there was sort of a leadership group from our Somalis, leadership group from Spanish speaking group, leadership from Hmong community, that sort of thing. And they sort of um, developed like little district um, kind of bilingual councils and they would meet um, quarterly. And then once they were sort of established in their own groups, they started meeting quarterly with the superintendent, all all of those language groups. So it was almost like a little mini United Nations. And it was pretty exciting because many of them would look at each other and say, oh, you're concerned about graduation in the Somali community? We're really concerned about it in the Hmong community. And they started to see a lot of the, the same issues rising to the, the forefront. And then they could present a, a collective voice um, with their own cultural communities represented as well but um, they started to really have a stronger role at the table to provide insight to district leaders about what they needed to see happen for their students. So there's a lot of things you can do if you have the bilingual resources to do the outreach. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Christina. Uh, unfortunately, that ends our uh, Q&A session. Um, thank you for, for your input. Uh, we've now got a quick message from our sponsor, Middlebury Interactive Languages. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you again for this opportunity to sponsor. So just to take a couple of very quick minutes um, to share a little bit more about um, Middlebury Interactive. Uh, we are, as I said earlier, a joint venture with Middlebury College. And we were really founded um, and, and the brainchild of the president of Middlebury College. And our pedagogical approach is grounded in the in the college's 100 years of expertise in second language acquisition. And so we are uh, fully research-based um, and uh, using the expertise of the college, Middlebury Interactives uh, uh, on staff experts, as well as outside experts like Jim Cummins, who helped us in the development of, this, uh, of, of our approach. Um, everything we do um, is teaching through uh, rigorous academic content at grade level, um, for our students, and as I said earlier, very much focused on academic English. So helping those kids uh, from grades four through uh, into high school uh, to, to, to be able to understand the core concepts that underlie uh, their uh, core content. So, so in social studies, uh, uh, science, English, and math. Um, and we really ha are providing a framework for teachers to for, to do that um, with our programs. And then, of course, we provide uh, professional development to help to be able to not only use Middlebury's uh, content, but also uh, technology, um, you know, as Nadja was talking about, bringing that into uh, uh, their um, uh, classrooms with their various uh, uh, initiatives with the iPad, um, and then, but also helping teachers to understand how to employ ELL strategies you know, as Christina was speaking to, um, getting content teachers more, more focused on, uh, on ELL support. So our feature, our, our, our courses have a few key features. Um, and as I've mentioned, um, they're on grade level. Uh, we use culturally inclusive uh, approaches for students so that each student, whether they're, um, they're Hmong, as uh, has been mentioned, or predominantly Spanish, as we all know, you know, they're able to bring their cultural understanding into their learning. Um, and we found that this is not only great uh, to get kids motivated, um, but it's also been um, a key to getting parental engagement as part of our, our uh, focus is on project-based learning and kids are going home speaking with, uh, with their parents, with members of their community. And that's really drawing the, that parental engagement that we all look for. We also use a modular approach, so our program can be broken down based on uh, key content so that it can be used 
uh, in a content classroom with a content specialist or uh, as part of a pullout model. Um, and then finally, um, you know, really just in, incorporating that challenging content to really boost those uh, learning outcomes so that kids are performing at grade level. So I want to thank uh, everyone again uh, for attending the, the webinar and, and uh, Edweek for allowing us to sponsor. Uh, you can learn more about Middlebury by going to our website, middlebaryinteractive.com, or I will give you one last chance to, uh, to, to let us know you'd like us to reach out to you with some more information to set up a demo or, or what have you. So thank you very much, and Corey, back to you. Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Chad. Uh, we'd like to remind you that if you'd like to watch today's presentation, uh, again, an on-demand archive will be made available through edweek.org within the next 24 hours. You can also visit edweek.org or the Learning the Language blog uh, at edweek.org to find articles that explore uh, today's topic. Uh, thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, uh, and for everyone uh, who uh, participated today. Thank you. It was wonderful.